Welcome to the Monday edition of Alaska Weather. I'm meteorologist Kimberly Hefner, and today is May 21st, 2018. When we're not here, you can always check out our forecast by dialing 1-800-472-0391, or you can always go to our website by going to weather.gov forward slash Alaska, and then clicking on the area of your choice. And then you can also reach out to us with any questions or suggestions to our TV lead, david.snyder at noaa.gov. Now in just a moment, we're gonna be on to talk about your public marine and aviation forecast. Let's start out the day with going to the Alaska breakup map, which was produced Monday, May 21st. And what we're gonna be focused on across the south southern tier of the state is mainly mostly open rivers here. And we just have some ice chunks that are flowing across some of these rivers. And then across the uh, northern tier of the state, mostly ice covered at this point. And they are expecting uh, the rivers to slowly break up as temperatures remain on the cooler side as we head through the next few days. Now let's take a look at the fire danger. It is minimal across the state. However, there is one small area across the central Alaska range there, a little bit drier and some possible thunderstorms uh, developing in the next few evenings. Now let's take a look at the low pressure systems across the area. There are two that we're gonna be talking about today. If you take a look at the map, you can see that it's a fairly active map with a spin out here over the Gulf of Alaska. We do have a low that's centering just along the southern Gulf, bring some moisture all the way back towards the northern tier of the state. So I'll just spin that one more time for you and you can see the large fetch of moisture that was tracking across the southeast panhandle earlier today. Now the second system out here towards the west is a fairly broad front that is pushed across the western and central Aleutians. The cloud plume is stretching up there towards Kamchatka. Uh, this front at the surface is just off to the wet, the low pressure system is set just to the west of Shimia. Now the frontal boundary stretches about to the Alaska um, I'm sorry, the eastern, western Alaska chain, and this is bringing some stronger southeasterly flow ahead of it with some rain along the boundary ahead of the system, some breaks in the clouds across some of the Bering and across the western Alaska Peninsula as just a weak ridge transverses between the low pressure here to the east. Now low pressure in the east, it's a 995 millibar low. It's pushed in a, a front up to the southeast coast and that's allowing some afternoon showers to develop. The upper level system, you can see there's a little bit of a circulation here to the south, so it's a very broad system. And this is pushing some upper level waves to the north. And with a weak trough boundary along the central interior, we're allowing some showers that have already developed this afternoon towards uh, the Aleutian ranges um, to the southwest and out towards the Kuskokwim valley locations. Now ahead of this system we're also seeing some shower activity across the Brooks Range and some snow showers just off the eastern Beaufort seacoast there and then a strong easterly wind along this tighter pressure gradient that extends down towards the Alaska Peninsula. Some snow showers were noted this afternoon across the Seward Peninsula to the northwest there. Now as we head through the overnight hours, expect low pressure in the Gulf to continue to spin. Upper level waves around this system is going to continue to push some moisture up through the southeast locations and along the Gulf Coast. Now we will see the winds taper down, which are fairly gusty this afternoon across the southeast between 20 to 45 miles per hour, uh, especially across the inner channels. That'll start tapering off late tonight. Uh, with the boundary beginning to slack or the pressure gradient slackening slightly ahead of this low pressure system. Now we will see a possible a thunderstorm or two across the lower Yukon and Kuskokwim valleys and that's expected during peak heating during the evening hours tonight. 
Now we'll see continued shower activity across much of the interior locations and light snow occurring across the northeastern Beaufort Sea Coast, patchy fog along the coastal locations back towards the northwest, and that strong northeast to north flow along the west coast will continue. Now the low pressure system out towards the west is going to be slowly pushing eastward, so this boundary is going to be making the progression to about the eastern uh, Lucian Chain and Pribilof Islands during the day tomorrow, so stronger southeasterly flow will be picking up ahead of this system. Now this broad low pressure system will push a few weak waves out ahead of it, so some light uh, rain activity will be moving into the eastern bearing waters. Wraparound moisture will keep shower activity all around this low pressure system and a stronger westerly component to the wind will be moving in just around uh, the Shimia locations and the also um, through the western or the central Aleutian chain. Now as we head into the day on Wednesday, this low pressure system is going to become the dominant low pressure. It's going to be driving a few things as we head into midweek. Let me just note that it's not going to have very strong winds as it pushes to the west coast and be making it through the west coast and the Alaska Peninsula during the day on Wednesday. Winds aren't going to be too bad when this approaches. And then across the backside, that's where the strongest winds into the south of the low core are going to be for your Wednesday. Uh, shower activity all around this system with some rain along the coast and Alaska Peninsula. Now, what I mentioned before was it's going to be influencing a new low pressure to develop across the Gulf of Alaska. And that's going to be affecting the southeast because we're going to see some continued rain activity for the southeast and all the coastal com communities, Prince William Sound and the eastern, east, eastern facing Kenai Peninsula. Now, we're going to see winds a little bit lighter when this low pressure system develops on Wednesday as the gradient just slackens with the high pressure uh, just off to the inland locations there, British Columbia. Low pressure is going to stay over the central interior areas of the state, and that's going to be uh, continuing to allow afternoon showers especially to develop and possibly might need to add some thunderstorms depending on where the thermal trough is aligned. Now to the north we're going to hang on to that stronger easterly flow with a tighter gradient high pressure to the north so just kind of squeezing as this trough pushes to the north slightly slightly more. The northwest coast however those winds might taper down uh, for a moment Wednesday afternoon. Now let's t talk about temperatures tonight into Tuesday Tuesday morning, we're going to see the warmest areas across the state, across the interior, back towards the southwest, with lows getting down into the lower 40s to upper 30s. Coastal locations will primarily be in the mid 40s with the higher 40s across the southeast. To the north, we'll see temperatures under the freezing mark in the upper teens to the mid 20s. Across the west coast, expect temperatures from the Seward Peninsula to be in the lower 30s, climbing slightly to the upper 30s across the Bristol Bay and Kuskokwim Delta locations. A little bit cooler across much of the bearing uh, for tonight. Temperatures are going to be getting down to near 40 or just below. And as we head into your Wednesday afternoon, temperatures are going to soar back up across the interior with temperatures making it into the lower 60s. Expect temperatures across the southern tier of the state to mainly be in the mid to upper 50s and then across the southeast still staying cooler um, although they're going to be getting up into the low to mid 50s without rain continuing through the day. The northern tier of the state is going to be just under that freezing mark in the upper 20s with areas along the Seward Peninsula getting up into the mid 30s and possibly upper 30s during the afternoon. So that's a little bit warmer for them and the southwest locations will be up there in the upper 50s as well across the Aleutian chain and Pribilofs mainly in the low to mid 40s. Now let's look at your um, temperatures for Wednesday morning. It's very similar to the previous day with temperatures ranging in the low to mid 40s across the interior locations of the state. And then we'll see temperatures in the upper 30s to lower 40s across the southern locations. The southeast will be climbing a little bit higher in the mid 
40s for you, and the north coast will be in the lower 20s, and the western areas of the state will be in the upper 40s to near 40. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Hello, and now let's take a look at your Tuesday morning flying weather conditions across the state. We will see some MVFR to IFR conditions from the Brooks Range and north, and then across the western um, areas of the state, we'll see some IFR and MVFR conditions across the eastern bearing down to the Alaska Peninsula, and also same conditions out further to the west. Now let's take a look to the east, and we'll see some MVFR conditions Tuesday morning along the Panhandle locations and much of the Gulf. Now when we head into the afternoon on Tuesday, expect IFR conditions to uh, spread a little bit further to the south across the north uh, coastal locations towards the Brooks Range. And we'll also see an introduced IFR conditions there for the afternoon from the eastern Alaska Peninsula towards the southern Gulf with overspreading MVFR conditions across much of the southeast. Now let's take a look at the west coast. We'll see spreading um, MVFR conditions into the west coast and we'll also see the IFR conditions advancing towards the Pribilof Islands during Tuesday afternoon with widespread MVFR conditions across much of the western and southern Bering. Now let's take a look at your Wednesday morning conditions. We will see that IFR across the Bering continue uh, spreading a little bit further back towards the western Aleutians for your Wednesday morning, overspreading MVFR conditions across much of the Bering waters and nudging into the we uh, west coast there. Now across the Gulf of Alaska, widespread MVFR and IFR conditions with the southeast seeing just a little bit less MVFR conditions uh, towards the Dixon entrance and across the inner channels for Wednesday morning. We will see MVFR conditions across some of the interior and then again along the north coast down through the Brooks Range. Now let's take a look at the afternoon hours. We will see a bit more IFR conditions for all locations um, to the north and to south and west. So IFR conditions moving into the eastern areas of the Kenai with MVFR spreading across the Gulf of Alaska and much of the coastal locations down through Kodiak seeing some IFR conditions as well. The southwest will also see uh, IFR, MVFR conditions with IFR conditions just off the coast and across much of the bearing for your Wednesday afternoon. Now let's take a look at your passes in more depth. We'll see Antuvik at MVFR all day and Attigan will follow suit MVFR. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass will both be VFR conditions and Rainy will be VFR and we'll see VFR across Windy and also for Isabel. We'll see uh, Mentasta at VFR However, um, Tanita will be also VFR. Uh, going over to Portage, MVFR conditions affected by the low pressure in the Gulf, Chilku and White Pass will also be MVFR. Now, your freezing levels to start the day off, the surface level is going to, to be just along the Brooks Range there and draped across the northern Bering waters. Then we'll see a rise in height 2 to 4,000 feet across the state with a, another rise across the southeast 4 to 8,000. And across the Bering, we'll see a climb from 4 to 10,000 feet across the uh, southern and central waters there. Let's take a look at your icing for Tuesday above 6,000 feet across much of the Bering for tomorrow. We'll see some icing across the interior and northern areas of the state, but we'll also see some icing along much of the Gulf and some of the southeast pan panhandle locations. Let's take a look at the jet stream right now. Um, that's only shifted slightly further to the east with these systems. The strongest jet is out here um, along the Aleutians at 140 knots with troughing along the Gulf and coming up through, streaming up that moisture up through a ridge along Northern America. Let's take a look at the 9,000 foot level. We have a low centered across the Gulf of Alaska, strong southerly uh, flow going up towards the southeast between 25 to 45 knots. Lighter speeds across the interior, more of a westerly flow, 10 to 15 knots, but more of an easterly flow across the north coast there at 25 knots. Change of wind direction around the low pressure system out to the west, strongest winds ahead of it between 40 to 45 knots. This system is a stack system, so at 3,000 feet we'll see the same directional changes with 25 to 35 knots at the 3,000 foot level. Uh, we have a light flow across the inland with that easterly flow across the east coast with low pressure across the Gulf, uh, bringing a 20 to 25 knot wind with change of directions around the low pressure set center. 
Now let's just take a look at the turbulence concerns across the area tomorrow below 5,000 feet with concerns across uh, mainly in the morning for the southeast and Panhandle along the north uh, below 5,000 feet as well, 3,000 feet, and then below 4,000 feet across the western and central. We always knew the site was there, but we thought it was gone due to erosion. My grandfather would tell about the uh, bow and arrow wars, about two kids, you know, playing with darts, and one eye was poked, so the other kid's father came and did the same thing. So from that, it became a full-blown war. To see this excavation bring that story alive is one of the most fascinating things I've seen. I mean, the stories we've heard and the evidence they're pulling out from Lunasa, it's no longer a legend, it's becoming a fact. My name is Rick Connect, and I'm principal investigator of the project. We have 11 PhDs. We use a lot of student volunteers. We work with professional conservators to make it all happen. We've got uh, Dr. Paul Ledger, who's working on the history of climate here. Dr. Veronique Forbes, who's an archaeoentomologist who studies insects. Uh, Dr. Kiki Ashlock, who's also a professional archaeologist from southeast uh, Alaska. Uh, Dr. Madonna Moss is from the University of Oregon, who specializes in faunal analysis. There are mussel shells throughout this site. There's another bigger piece, and we, and we don't know where they're coming from. The Nunalik site uh, was originally um, a village. Uh, elders tell us that this site extended out about 200 feet. Since 2009, we've lost more than 30 feet on that piece of shoreline. And uh, our 2009 and 2010 excavation blocks are completely gone already. It's very much a race against time. But this particular structure with a covered boardwalk running down the middle of it was an adaptation to the bow and arrow wars. That was a period of intense conflict between different native villages here in the YK Delta and uh, no one knew exactly when it had happened other than it happened before the Russians arrived. This collective communal house was burned down by attackers from another village up to Kuskokwim. We think it happened about 1640 based on carbon dates of the charred grass and so on on the floor. We've been excavating Nunasak for about six years now. A, um sent Rick a few pictures of artifacts I had from the locals. He came right over. He didn't even unpack. He went down the beach and they started walking and they started finding artifacts. Those first group was a tough bunch. There's these three students and a professor that come down and start looking for artifacts. Wind, rain, shine, they do it. My mind was saying, man, these guys are crazy. But they're trying to beat the erosions. We get bugs, we get weather, we get wind, we get rain. Ouch, there's one now. Um, and so they're pretty challenging conditions. We put in as many hours as we physically can, 12 to 14 hours a day, six days a week, just so we can get to it in time. Pizza! Give me pizza! <laughs> Rick's just great, he's, he doesn't stop. He, he's a perfect person for this site. I wouldn't have no one else run this site except him. Well, I first came to Alaska to work as a graduate student in 1983, and luckily it was a preserved uh, site much like this one in Kodiak. And that one was also eroding, and we worked hard to get a sample from that, but at the same time, our assumption was there, might, there were gonna be more sites like that, and the whole thing washed out. There wasn't even a rock, a firecrack rock left behind. That was shocking. And we ended up only getting a 10% sample at best, and that's not gonna happen again. 
we're getting things that normally you just see in museum collections. We're, we've got arrows with the feathers still lashed to them, grass rope that was used to make uh, dog harnesses, that kind of preservation. There's a piece of hair right here. I found that in my screen. PT found a ridiculously large amount of hair and Bridget found another huge clump of hair today. It seems like when they cut their hair, they just let it fall wherever it wanted to, so. There's the lamp. <laughs> the hair is kind of sticking out right there. It's all over the place, actually. There's been way hairier lamps, too. It's like, oh, you find hair and you're like, oh, this is like a hair sample, and then you dig a little more and then it's actually a lamp. <laughs> Bridget found an earring in the screen. Yeah, that's definitely font. Yeah. And then I would have a, it goes up to about there, I think. So I don't know how they actually wore them, like how it they fit kinda, in. Yeah, they kind of look like clip-ons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've heard that we're up to around 30,000 museum quality pieces which will be coming back to Queen Hawk in 2017. We're hoping to get a cultural center built here, um, and then I'm hoping all the artifacts will remain in the village. We estimate the site might have five to 10 years left maximum. It could be lost in one big winter storm. It's like a museum's on fire or a library, and you have to rush in and save as many books and pieces of art as you can. And we're seeing things that um, people remember from their childhoods. Elders uh, have a chance to reacquaint themselves and their children with tangible remains of their heritage. Yeah, this project's been great. I'm just honored to be part of it, a small part of it. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Hello, and now on to the marine portion of the show. Uh, let's start off with your sea ice edge, and we're looking at mostly open water across the northwest coast here, down through the Bering Strait. Uh, we are looking at the next few days, uh, keeping areas on the cooler side, some northerly flow, so not too much change is expected here. We do still have some ice along the edge, uh, just off the coast near Amonic. So this is going to continue over the next few days. Uh, we do, are expecting a slower breakup of the ice across um, the coastal locations north of Barrow as we do have older ice in these locations. So it's got uh, less sea salt concentration in those locations. So expect the progress to be slow for the ice uh, edge as we head into the coming days. Now let's take a look at your forecast for the southeast. I'll step out of your way here. Uh, we will see a strong southerly flow for your Tuesday across the outer coast with small crafts there to the north. Uh, mainly a southerly flow, 15 knots across the inner channels with seas between three to five feet. Outer waters will be between 10 and 11 feet. Looking at your Wednesday forecast, a little bit of a change in direction winds across the outer waters um, from west to south to southeast. And then we'll see primarily a southerly flow across the inner channels. However, towards the southern inner channels, we'll see more of a northwesterly flow. Uh, waters, uh, the sea heights on this day will be between two to three feet, and then we'll see not eight to nine feet across the outer waters. Now let's take a look at the northern gulf. We'll see a stronger wind here, uh, small crafts out of the east to north direction, northerly flow across the Cook Inlet, 10 knots, a little bit lower there. Uh, the seas will be three feet across the Prince William Sound where the speeds are lighter at 15 knots out of the northeast. Seas across the Gulf waters will be between eight to 10 feet with the southern Cook Inlet between uh, two to three feet. Now let's take a look at your Wednesday forecast, a little bit different on this day, a different wind direction change, but everything looks like it's gonna be under small craft for 
Wednesday. Now we'll see seas between one to two feet across the Prince William Sound and the Cook Inlet locations a little bit higher there towards the southern um, Kenai Peninsula at three feet and then the outer waters will be between four to seven feet. Now let's take a look at your uh, waters across the Alaska Peninsula. A directional flow around low pressure out there will be more of a west direction to northwest flow. And we'll see seas on this day six feet across the Bering side and around seven feet across the Pacific side. Now as we head into your Wednesday, change of wind direction with um, more of a southerly component. and. Everything's going to be under small craft for this location too, and we'll see between, seas between four to six feet. Now let's take a look at your uh, Aleutian chain, and I'll step over here so you can see the entire area, primarily uh, southwesterly component uh, to the west and southerly towards the eastern Aleutian chain. And seas on this day are going to be between five to ten feet across the eastern and central Aleutians, out towards the west a little bit higher between 17 to 20 feet. Now let's take a look at your Wednesday forecast for the western Aleutians. Those small crafts are staying and pushing over towards the eastern Aleutians, more of a southwesterly component uh, for the eastern Aleutians on this day, uh, becoming more southerly just north of Unalaska there for Wednesday. And then seas on this day will range between 7 to 20 feet with the highest seas on the Pacific side and to the west your west coast. We're going to see a change of wind direction around the eastern waters here, more of a north, northerly component uh, towards the north waters and towards the central bearing will be more of a southerly flow. Now looking at seas this day between four to five feet and for your Wednesday, uh, primarily uniform east to southeasterly flow between uh, two to nine foot seas. Highest seas are going to be out towards the central and nor northern waters. Now let's take a look at your Tuesday forecast around the north and west coast locations. Uh, small craft or gusty winds there across the north and northwest locations with more of a northwesterly component towards the Kotzebue Sound. Uh, seas and open waters is going to be between 5 to 7 feet. Looking at your Wednesday forecast, pretty much an easterly flow hanging on across that north coast. And then we'll see uh, more of a southerly component to easterly component around that Seward Peninsula. Seas on this day will range between two to five feet in ice-free waters. Recapping your forecast, we're gonna see some showers continue through the next few days with some possible thunderstorms across the in interior during the day. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. <laughs>